Well, good morning, viewers. Today, we're going to be exploring Kerak Castle, an ancient crusader castle, or crack of the desert, as it's colloquially known. Now, you remember we visited the Muslim Ajloon Castle up north. That castle was built about 50 years after this one was built um, by the Christians. It is blindingly bright today. I'm not one eye drunk, I'm one eye blind from the sun. So yeah, this is built in the 1140s. It's built by the Crusaders. Um, and just looking at the sheer scale of this castle, you can immediately see why the Muslims felt it was necessary to build their own castle. You know, the, there was clearly a massive um, presence here that the Christians had established. And it was built by a lord called Pagan and the king of Jerusalem called Folk. And it became a pagan sort of center of power um, in this region. Um, it was able to control Bedouin tribes as well as trade routes uh, between Mecca and obviously Damascus uh, over in Syria. Folk was actually in charge when the Jerusalem kingdom was at its biggest. It comes to a bit of a gruesome end. Folk uh, is hunting one day in Israel and he falls off his horse and his uh, uh, his saddle comes off, it crushes his skull and there's a, like a notable chronicler at the time who says that Falk's brains came out of his ears and his nose. So yeah, not the best end to Falk, um, but just a little gruesome bit of history for you there. So this is the Byzantine ditch designed to keep siege weapons away from the walls. And it's, it's when you come down here, you can really appreciate just the height of this thing and the magnitude of it. It's similar to when we were at Ajloon Castle in the north, the one built by the Muslims, uh, or the Ayyubids, I should say, who was Saladin's uh, empire, in that sort of moat as well, you really can get an appreciation for just how much work and must have gone into carving out, you know, pieces of rock with, you know, basic tools. People's entire lives dedicated to that kind of single task. It's just insane. This isn't my best camera work, but it has square towers. And that's kind of quite a rudimentary structure that kind of evolves over time. Round towers and, you know, curves essentially. Easier to kind of um, spot enemies and easier to also uh, defend uh, because there's no kind of angles in it. The castle has what's called these glasses, and that's an artificial slope made of steep, slippery masonry at the base of the walls. And that basically stopped attackers able to kind of climb up. But also, if they did attempt to climb up, it would take them more time to get to the top. And that gave the uh, people on top, you know, more time to engage with them with, you know, various projectiles. So it's uh, an interesting thing that I've not really seen, you know, on many other castles. It's designed to be kind of slippery and made of like slippery stone. And I don't know if that's because this has sort of been kind of, you know, refabricated over the years and reconstructed, but certainly in our experience kind of doing this hiking, I would have thought that a bit of loose stone and some sudden cliffs, you know, like that kind of stuff down there um, is sort of more difficult to kind of get over, but I suppose maybe not, who knows. It's positioned on top of a hill uh, obviously it makes this a prime example of a spur castle. And that's a castle where you're using uh, the natural topography of the land to create a defensive position, you know, on a hill. What that means as well, using the natural topography, is I, th I think on this particular castle, it's only the south side uh, that can really be approached. Um, and so that means that, you know, in a defensive situation, the castle can concentrate its forces on one side and can leave, you know, um, you know less, I guess, personnel uh, on the other sides of the castle that are more difficult to kind of um, attack it from. Maybe the, worst thing up is, there. the worst thing is about you doing that was Amy's like, let me get a video of you walking for B-roll, but the worst thing about that is, I'll see if I can show you, is there's two blokes above me who definitely saw that whole thing. If they saw, if they saw that like awkward fake walk into the, uh, into the castle. 
Now I feel very sheepish. I don't care. So this pagan bloke, uh, the Lord, uh, he had two nephews, uh, Maurice, I know, it's an interesting name, and I can't remember what the other one was called. And uh, they uh, added two towers, and also they're responsible for the two ditches at the either end, um, one of which at the south end used to be a cistern for, you know, holding water as well so sort of dual purpose so the most notable crusader um, architecture is the north wall which we just saw outside we were on the other so we were over there so it's this wall uh, into which are built uh, giant arched halls so this is the north wall that we were talking about and these are those immense um, arch halls. And these archways above me were used as stables, um, were also living quarters, and were also uh, used to defend against siege weapons from the outside. They were, they were fighting gallery from the inside. And the thick walls were used because siege weapons were suddenly being used by the Ayyubids uh, and the Muslims. And so in this period of history, we start to see much thicker walls. So here you can see what I mean about the uh, fighting gallery. So you can defend against people coming in here. Look at that for, look at that for videography skills. Look at that. I mean, he's only been YouTubing for five minutes. And he's got those, look at that bloody hell man. Steven Spielberg, get your heart out. Anyway, wait till you see this footage. So P Pagan, that lord who had this place built, um, had a nephew, Philip, uh, Philip and Maurice, those two who were responsible for digging that ditch. And Philip had a daughter, Stephanie, and Stephanie married a French knight. The name of that French knight, I'll get it for you so I don't mess this up, is Reynald of Chatelon. And Reynald uh, gained possession of this castle um, by you know, marrying Stephanie, essentially. Reynald was a bit of a pain in the ass for Saladin because he would raid the, the trade camel trains uh, of Saladin. And at one point he even tried to attack Mecca uh, itself. So incidentally, the Royal Army had previously defeated Saladin um, really quite badly at the Battle of Montesquard. And that was in uh, 1177. And Saladin himself described it as a huge defeat, and he ended up going back to Egypt uh, with 10% uh, of his fighting force. At the time, people obviously gave credit to the king, etc. But a lot of Muslim scholars um, attributed the victory in a large part to the um, commanding of Reynald, this French knight. Now, I don't think that Reynald was like 100% a chill dude. He once had this Latin patriarch, Amory, tortured because he wouldn't support him uh, financially on one of his expeditions. Um, and it was pretty brutal. Reynald had Amory's body beaten until it was bloody, stripped naked, covered in honey, and left in the burning sun on top of the citadel so he would be attacked by insects. So yeah, I'm not sure he was like the nicest guy. So in 1183, Saladin besieged Renald, and I've come down into the sort of caverns to kind of give you a sense of what it would have been like to be under here besieged. And what's interesting is, um, history often portrays Saladin as quite a chivalrous guy. And in one example, uh, which is this one where he's being besieging uh, Renald, um, there's a marriage taking place between a lord and lady, an important one, and they, after some negotiations, Saladin agrees not to attack or besiege that specific area of the castle with his siege weapons. But ultimately, the siege is unsuccessful. The king of Jerusalem, Baldwin IV, essentially intercepts the siege. But not one to be deterred, Saladin then besieged the castle the following year in 1184 once again. This time, he attempted to fill in the ditches uh, around the castle so that he could get his siege engines um, up to the walls. And typical of Jordan, there's like zero health and safety. <laughs> you could so easily just walk off the edge. 
because they don't have any signs anywhere, so it's difficult to know where everything actually is, but I think this is the chapel. But anyway, I thought I'd just continue the Saladin story. So he besieged him once, didn't work. He besieged him twice, he filled in the ditches the second time in 1184, and again, it didn't work. Uh, each time, uh, the reinforcing crusader army came in and got rid of him. But then, in the 12th century, Saladin's nephew had a go. And this time, it was after the Battle of Hattin. And you remember that was the decisive battle where the Muslims um, won over the Crusaders. And that meant that there was no army that could come to Karak Castle's aid during the besiege. And so finally, Karak Castle was captured by Saladin's nephew and the Ayyubids. So there you have it. That's kind of the history of the Crusaders here and the kings of Jerusalem. They had this place for a while. It allowed them to really have a dominion over the Bedouins and really control trade routes. Uh, but in the end, uh, after three sieges by the uh, Ayyubids, in the end, they captured it. But alas, that is not the end of the history. It remains very important. Now that the Ayyubids are in charge and Saladin you know, has it under his control, he passes it to his brother. Uh, he uses it as a treasury, uh, and it remains a treasury uh, until the end of the Ayyubid dynasty. Uh, and in fact, they, tre they treated it with such importance that along with Damascus, it was the only place that was allowed to use official, or allowed to use red paper uh, for their official correspondence. And then later, uh, you may remember the Mamluks, uh, who uh, were essentially almost like a mercenary group that used to um, work for Saladin and the Ayyubids. They were staged here for, for a time. And during this Mamluk period, there's uh, evidence that there are 700 horsemen here, which kind of gives you a sense of the scale of this place and, and just how many uh, military men would have been held here. So throughout history, this castle was very important to the Crusaders, very important to Saladin, and then equally very important to Mamluk. And then later when we get into the Ottoman Empire and it's more towards sort of modern history, again, there are periods of time where the, the castle was under siege uh, and it was used as a fortress and used um, to much strategic advantage. Amy sort of pointed out earlier that the masonry is kind of crude and that is not something that's been unnoticed. It was crude masonry. And in fact, although this was a very large and strong castle, it actually kind of lacked sophistication. And when you look at castles um, like Crac de Chevalier, Chevalier, sorry, <laughs> uh, up in Syria, that's a much more um, complex and I guess arguably more impressive castle than this one. But that's not to say that this wasn't important. Before castles like this, in the very early Crusades, um, you know, we, they just had towers, just simple towers. And so this was a significant advancement. One thing that I've read online is that the Crusaders used rough volcanic stone uh, to build their sections. Uh, and when it came under Ayyubid control, um, they used sandstone and limestone, which they got from local quarries, which I think these archways uh, over there are made of. So it, uh, someone with a keener eye than I have for geology would probably be able to discern what was built by who, just based on what rock, for, uh, what rock types they are. all sorts of nicks and crannies. It would be awesome just to know which of these caverns, if you will, uh, would have been the ones where the uh, <clears throat> Lord and Lady were getting married. Um, or rather where their bedchamber was, I think it was, that was going to be uh, avoided when they're under, under siege, and also how accurate they could be with siege weapons, projectiles, in order to avoid a certain area of the castle.
you know that you're a bit of a loser when you get super excited about towers and the curtain walls. Like I've been trying to see an example of this, but I just couldn't see it anywhere. So the towers in this wall uh, are placed uh, at regular points uh, along the wall. And this is known as Byzantine tower structure, are identical to the ones used by the Byzantine Empire. And another feature is that in Karak Castle, the towers are much closer together uh, than normal tower, uh, normal castles. And that in theory is to increase visibility. It is blisteringly hot right now. So this over here is the south side. So this is the side, I believe, where they would have been primarily defending the castle. So this in here will be facing towards the south side. So this is the side down here, I believe, where the marauding armies would have come from. Would you like to do some anyway? I think you've covered it. <laughs> you think I just got 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 the bare bare facts? You got the bare minimum. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone's gonna watch this. <laughs> I don't care. I like it. <laughs> I'd love to kick back on the sofa and watch someone walk around a crusader castle and just give me you know, a couple couple key points. That's what's been done here today, just to be clear. Just a couple key points. You also <laughs> better be drinking a nice cold drink for us as well. Yeah, on the sofa. <laughs> yeah. Whoever you are, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> Amy currently hiding in every single little bit of shade she can find. So there we have it, Karak Castle. An example of one of the first castles built by the Franks that used a fortified tower structure and a notable example of Crusader architecture, a mixture of Western European, Byzantine and Arab design. Bit of a mouthful. It's possible that I focused on some areas more than others. <laughs> it's also possible that I haven't got things 100% accurate, but <laughs> I hope that gives you a general impression at least. <laughs>